I wash my natural hair and my face with the same product because natural hair care is easy. Natural skin care is easy. If you want to have a better view on how the Bible looks at women in its proper context, then you should get these two books. Matriarchs of the Covenant, written by Abdil Ben Levi, popularly known as Zion Lex. This is a masterpiece. All right, shalom and blessings to everybody in the building. If everybody can hear me, quickly type a one in the chat room. If you guys can hear me, I want to get started. ASAP. If you guys can hear me loud and clear, type a one in the chat room. I want to get started ASAP. All right, I want to get started ASAP. I want to ask everybody, please, like, share, and subscribe. More importantly, share this live stream. Because this is going to be one of those live streams. I'm going to tell you that right now. Share this live stream. This is, this is, this is going to be one of those lives that I'm telling you now, share the live stream. Share the live stream. By the way, by the way, shout out to the good brother, Divine Prospect. Shout out to my brother, Divine Prospect of Kingdom Harbinger Ministries. I've been knowing Divine Prospect since about late 2013. I met Divine Prospect around the time of what was called Kemet on Trial, which was my introduction to the House of Consciousness, Sarna the Studios, Sarna himself, and what we call today the Conscious Community, right? So if you guys are checking the clock, that was 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, I met the good brother Divine Prospect and, um, I don't want to say we clicked automatically, but I definitely want to say that there was mutual respect from the gate. Absolutely. Um, I believe that he has expressed to me that I had uh, his respect. And I've certainly expressed to him at that time, and obviously still now, that uh, he has uh, my respect as well. And uh, we've remained um, brothers, friends, to a certain extent and measure, I'm going to be very honest with this live stream, to a certain extent and measure. Um, and even when we've had issues, we've re remained amicable, right? It's, you're always going to have issues as brothers, as brothers and sisters, as a family. But the real measure to me of a stand-up man is how amicable we can treat our differences, right? Do we have to be enemies because we differ? So that's something that I've always admired about the relationship that I've had with Divine Prospect. Even amidst our differences, we didn't have to be enemies per se. Now, I do want to be ultra honest and admit this. The last public conversation I had with Divine Prospect wasn't too great. Um, I made an accusation against him. Uh, I felt at the time that I was being railroaded by him. I felt at the time that he wasn't showing brotherly love in the way that I did. And as classic Zionless behavior, which I'm not trying to praise, I certainly lashed out on the brother publicly on side of, the, uh, on side of his platform. And that's something that I, I couldn't say that I regret, but that's something that I'm not proud of. I'm certainly not proud of. I'm not, I'm not proud of using any platform to speak um, towards a personal issue that I have with a brother, my brother. I, I know that moving forward, I can do better um, and we can do better as a community. So um, I first want to set it up by saying shout out to that good brother. Um, he reached out to me on YouTube sometime late last week. Um, you know, to simply say, uh, I believe he, he caught a recent video of mine where I had, you know, 
place him highly, as as I always do. You know, what, one thing about divine, one thing about divine prospect is interesting about our relationship. Even when I found a personal issue with me, with him, it never once stopped me from being open and honest about the way in which I respect his scholarly contributions and what he brings to the Israelite community. And that says a lot because oftentimes, whether we're in a spiritual circle or religious circle or not, the moment that people have a personal issue with you, now all of a sudden they want to act like you're dumb, you're slow, and nobody should trust you. And to me, that's fake. A personal issue is just that, a personal issue. It should never rob me of any uh, intellectual respect that I've had for your mind, your way of thinking, right? A personal issue is just that, a personal issue. So I just want to be clear, even amidst the personal issues that I've had with Divine over the years, and even recently, it never once made me go public and say that Divine is not a pillar in our community, that he's not someone that should be well sought after, because in fact, that's what I continue to do in spite of our differences. And I'm hoping that um, they say leaders should lead by example and teachers should teach by example. So if we're humble, let's be humble by example, right? I am not so great that I can't be honest and say I was wrong. So I have a lot to say. I'm hoping to see the Kingdom Harbinger Ministry flash and raid this live stream. I want to see a stream of people from Kingdom Harbinger Ministry jump on this live. And we might even get a surprise. We might even get a surprise. We'll see. We'll see. So I want to jog back everybody's memory. And I just want to ask the chat some questions before I show some things. So the first thing I want to say is, how many of you out there remember Kemet on trial? If you remember Kemet on trial, put a one in the uh, chat room or put a fire emoji in the chat room. I want to know who out there remembers Kemet on trial. Were you around during Kemet on trial? How many of you actually were awakened Israelites during that huge event known as Kemet on trial? Oh, man. Look at that. Shout out to my sister Tahira, beloved Ty. Shout out to my brother Mori, Yirmi Yahoo. Uh, shout out to Cam, Ibed Yisrael, Mori Zafon, Tazapoan, Nehemiah. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of you. 617, let's get it. Asiatic soldier, I see you. Vernon, you already know, man. Jungle Nils in the building, Vernon. Uh, Jungle Nils in the in the building, Vernon. They don't know how real it get, Vern, when you got to cross the tracks from Arlington to the harbor. They don't know how real it get. Shut up, big homie. I see you. I see you. I see you. So it seems like a lot of y'all remember that. A lot of y'all remember that, right? A lot of y'all remember that. And so that was my introduction to the conscious community. I had never heard of the conscious community before nor anybody from that community. Literally never heard of these guys before. But I'm glad that I had that experience because it is in part the reason why you guys see me on this platform today, right? So shout out to HOK and Sonata uh, for that as well. And so shortly after Kevin on trial, a group known as the Hebrew War Machine if you know who and what the Hebrew war machine is, I'm going to need you to put some fire emojis in the chat room, and I'm going to need you to spell out Hebrew war machine. If you remember the Hebrew war machine, which started circa 2014, I want you to light this chat room up with some fire emojis. If you was a member of the Hebrew war machine, I want you to put member, right? I want you to put member. Now, I'm going to call out the names of some of the people associated with the Hebrew War Machine. 
There's one particular name that for obvious reasons I won't be calling out. And I respect this person's contributions and I respect this person's knowledge base. But because of things that have transpired, um, I obviously won't be naming this person's name. All right. Uh, but I will say everybody else's name. And so if you remember the Hebrew war, war machine, that means you remember Hurricane Hashar. Huh? Huh? How many of y'all remember Hashar? Huh? Hashar was no joke. Hashar is no joke. Big salute to the brother Hashar, also known as Hurricane Hashar. Big salute to him. Huh? AOC in the building. Huh? If y'all remember the Hebrew war machine, how many of you know who priest Daniela is? How many of you know who priest Daniela is, huh? Shout out to priest Daniela. L-O-I, Lines of Israel. I got one particular name that might surprise y'all because the Hebrew war machine was a, a pretty big conglomerate. At one time, we had some of your very favorite Israelites a part of that group. Right now, I don't think I need to name myself, but I was a part of the Hebrew War Machine, an original member, a founding member, in fact, um, and definitely one of the generals of the Hebrew War Machine. Um, how many of you remember? I got a name, I know you know him, but how many of you remember that before I'm gonna say it? And I mean this respectfully, because when we talk the history, we have to talk the history. A lot of people aren't aware of Israelite history. Like I could go way further back than 2013. I could take you guys into the 90s. And, and for me, that's where my beginning is, right? I could take y'all into the mid 90s. If I share the experience of my elders, I could take you guys into the 50s, all the way into the 1918s uh, and upward or downward, right? But I got one for y'all. Before this brother began to build camps all across North America, before this particular brother began to build camps in parts of South America and the Caribbean, before this brother began to accrue celebrity membership in his movement, shout out to Jagged Edge, before this brother became the popular name that you guys know him as none other than Gorilla Hebrew was a part of the Hebrew war machine. Big shout out and big salute to Gorilla Hebrew. This was long before he created Sakari. He was an original member of a group that I was a founding member of, which is known as the Hebrew war machine. We just gonna keep it real today. I got a lot to say, but I'm going to keep it all the way true with y'all. I'm not holding back. I'm going to just speak my mind and say some things. So if you guys don't mind, if I got, matter of fact, if I got y'all permission to speak my mind, I want y'all to throw some 100s in the chat room, right? Let's see that emoji 100. If y'all don't mind me speaking my mind and saying things that probably ain't politically correct, but it's all the way true, it's all the way real, then I want y'all to put some 100s in the room real quick. Let me know if I got your permission. Because I'm going to say some things. I'm going to say some things. All right? I'm going to say some things. Now, to my knowledge, somebody said, what about the mighty Hebrew? I have a lot of respect for the mighty Hebrew. But to my knowledge, at least when I was there, the mighty Hebrew was not a part of the Hebrew war machine. Right? He was absolutely not a part of the Hebrew war machine. If he was, that took place when I left. Because certainly when I was with the Hebrew war machine, the mighty Hebrew was not a part of it, right? That, that's no slide on the brother. Again, I got y'all permission to keep it real. I got y'all permission to tell the history. So that's what I'm going to do, all right? So uh, much respect to the mighty Hebrew. But when I was a part of the Hebrew war machine, when the Hebrew war machine was founded and, and our sister in the building, beloved Ty, she could tell you respectfully, mighty Hebrew was not a part of the original founding members of the Hebrew war machine. But again, this is not meant to slight him. Somebody just put the comment in the room and said, what happened to the mighty Hebrew? And I just want to clarify that he wasn't part of the original Hebrew war machine. I mean, we had a 
an insane lineup. If I was to tell y'all every single person associated with it, we would have to do a whole live stream on that. If I was to sit down and tell you guys some of the plans that we had in action, we would literally have to do a whole live stream just on that, which in fact, I would love to do that one day soon. All right? I would want to do that one day soon. And as our sister said, the original Hebrew War Machine, you was on Group Me. We was on Group Me, right? Which was a live text thread. The app is called Group Me, right? This was before Clubhouse, right? Hold on, because if I'm really checking the temperature, this was before Instagram. This was before Instagram. Yeah. This was also before Instagram. Watch this. It gets a little deeper. This was before 90% of the people I just named even had a YouTube channel or their own YouTube video. All facts. All facts. Right? So I'm, I'm setting this up for a reason, y'all, because I'm going somewhere in a couple of moments. So I just want to give you guys a little bit of history. Right, because I'm gonna be going somewhere in a couple of moments, and before I all the way get there, I just gotta check the record real quick and give y'all some history. All right, so um, the Hebrew War Machine was a very powerful conglomerate. Pretty much everybody that was an original member of the Hebrew War Machine. Pretty much, I mean, there's always some, some you know, some lackeys. <laughs> there's always some lackeys. I want to say one lackey's name. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chill because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get better in life. So I'm a chill. But there's one lackey's name that I really want to say. I really want to say this dude's name. But to say his name kind of gives him, you know, gives him an audience that he he doesn't have. So he's gonna he's gonna remain unnamed right now. But there's one person I would love to name as a lackey that ain't went nowhere. You know, when you light a firecracker and it starts. And it don't go off. That was dude. That was homeboy, right? He was looking lit for a little bit, but nothing ever really popped off. <laughs> you can't make this up. Homeboy was looking a little lit, un poquito, just for a little minute. When I say a little minute, I literally mean a little minute. He was looking lit for a little minute, you know, like a firecracker. And you just waiting. Because it never actually popped off. All right? No, I'm not Israel Doctrine. I ain't talking about Israel Doctrine. Shout out to my brother Serene, huh? That's right. That's right, Ty. Shout out to my brother Serene. Absolutely. Shout out to the homie Serene. The very first book I published, it was written and engraved. Our brother Serene is the editor for that book. Uh, he's responsible for helping me to put that book out. Right? He's responsible for helping me to put that book out. Shout out to my brother, Serene, the sage in Atlanta, Georgia. Shout out to that brother, man. Doing great work, as always. The House of Levy. Huh? Let him tell you. Bait Levy. Huh? And so it's about to get very real in a couple of moments, y'all. So I'm going to ask everybody to make sure that if you aren't already subscribed to Zion Lex TV, Make sure that you like, subscribe, and hit that bell, right, so that you get all the notifications. Make sure you hit the bell so that you get all of the notifications. I don't want to, I don't want anybody to miss when we're going live, all right? I don't want to miss, I don't want anybody to miss when we're going live, all right? So let me jump in real quick and kind of forward a little bit. Shortly after Kemet on trial, the Hebrew War Machine put together an event um, in praise and in honor of the sisterhood, in honor of women. And that was a powerful event. We held that event at the National Black Theater in Harlem, right? Which is the, the actual site for many historical debates and lectures, not just from the House of Consciousness, but from some of the greatest leaders in our current era. Dr. Sabi spoke at the National Black Theater. Shout out to 
our ancestor, right? Shout out to our ancestor. If you guys like Dr. Savi, and I ain't saying that that means you agree with everything he said, but if you guys value Dr. Savi, you like this information, I'm going to need everybody to light this chat room up with Dr. Savi's name and some fire emojis. Let's show some love real quick, y'all. Let's show some love. This is going to be one of those lives. I'm going to let y'all know right now. It's going to be one of those lives. I'm in, I'm, 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 in a, I'm in a spirit right now. I want to say I'm in the spirit right now, right, that is going to make for a very powerful discussion, a very powerful discussion, all right? So many of the places that we spoke, uh, spoke at, we had Dr. Sabi there. You know, we had Dr. Sabi there. Oh, let me introduce you guys to somebody real quick. Let me introduce you guys to somebody real quick. I want everybody to watch out for this young brother right here. We know him as Rav Kimwell. We know him as Rav Kimwell. Pretty soon, you guys will be introduced to him formally. Be on the lookout for this young brother. Powerful, smart brother. Who I am 1,000% sure that I could put my name and my brand on the line and say the impact that he will have in our community will help to take us to the next level. I want to even refer to this brother as my protege. as my protege, somebody that I've been working with very close within the last few years behind the scenes, somebody that I've developed a genuine love and appreciation for their honorable character and intellectual and spiritual skill sets over the years. I'm going to tell y'all right now, when this brother steps up, it's going to rock the community because he is sharp. He is Shaw. All right. Shout out to my protege. I even want to say, and my son's somewhere in here, so he he might feel some type of way. But like I said, we got to keep it real. I see this brother. I might be showing my age as a spiritual son. I look at this brother as a spiritual son. In fact, I refer to him as Benny, my son. And every now and again, he make me feel old, hit me with a text and be like, Shalom, Abba. And in the back of my head, I be like, how old is he? God damn, I feel old. Did he just call me Abba? Shit, I'm old. <laughs> but hey, that's the legacy of our glorious culture, heritage, and tradition. That when you have a skillful teacher and you have a great, skillful student, the relationship that the Torah demonstrates between those two is like father and son. And I'm going to tell y'all right now, if y'all have come to like me over the years, when one of my sons step out, and the one I'm talking about now is Rob Kimwell, when he step out, it's going to be nothing but problems, I promise y'all problems because his brain a little sharper than mine his memory is a little sharper than mine his energy level is a little sharper maybe even greater than mine and his humility is greater than mine and above everything i mentioned if there's one thing he has that puts him on a track to greatness is humility. So look out for my baby, Ralph Kimberwell. With that being said, let me move on, man. Let me move on. Let me move on. I got a lot to say. I got a lot to show. And so, shortly after our event for women, we had a debate. The debate took place at a temple that I formerly attended. 
that is temple shema israel amen amen i told y'all today's live stream i got a lot to say y'all probably gonna want to thumb up the video you probably gonna want to like the video you probably gonna want to share this video because i have a lot to say today right now a debate was held at a temple that i formerly attended known as shema israel my introduction to shema israel occurs in the year 1995. i want to say late fall because it was about maybe i know for a fact they was about to observe yom kippur because my very first holy day at shema was yom kippur so we talking about yom kippur 1995 was around the first time i walked into the doors at shema israel shema israel and um for those of you who know shema israel this is a mighty mighty israelite congregation filled with men and women of yah god almighty when i tell you that this congregation is in part responsible for making me the man that i am today and still in part aspire to be i'm gonna tell you i owe a lot to congregation shema israel in fact let me give you guys a visual real quick i'm gonna talk to y'all today if you guys don't mind I'm going to talk to y'all today. If you don't mind, I'm going to talk to you today. I have a lot to say. Some of it, everybody might not like. But uh, one thing about me, I'm very respectful. Unless I feel the need to reserve the right to be respectful. Other than that, I'm a very respectful brother. So I want to pay homage for a moment as I say some things real quick. Shout out to one of my greatest teachers. One of the greatest teachers I have ever had in my life and possibly one of the greatest teachers I will ever have in my life. Shout out to Hanasi Sapor Bain Zivaloon, the founder and leader of Congregation Shema Yisrael, hallelujah, shout out to you, Chief Prince, Hamasi, support. What a mighty man of Yah. Huh? The man been serving the almighty God, I want y'all to listen to me, for 50 plus years. Do I have y'all undivided attention? Huh? I'm not telling you the brother is 50 years old. I'm telling you the brother has been serving the Almighty for at least 50 plus years in the Israelite community. A soldier, a general for God Almighty. What a mighty man of Yah, Prince of Poor is. Much love and much respect to Hanasi support. I learned under his tutelage what an Israelite leader should be. I learned under his tutelage what an Israelite man should look like. And I'm still trying to find the look because he got it mastered and I'm, I, I, I ain't close to that. He got the, he got it. We And the behavior and the passion and the drive, I still can learn a thing or two from my beloved elder, Hamasi Principal. 
You guys might know them on YouTube as Shema Israel HIC2. Principal comes from two very old congregations here in New York City, and one of them also in part based in Chicago. Those congregations are Hashaba Yisrael, founded by Cohen Levy. Ha Cohen Levy, Cohen Levy, huh? Cohen Levy's legacy in the Israelite community goes back to the early 50s. The early 50s, the early 1950s, Cohen Levy was teaching our people about the true and the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Much love and respect to Hakohen Levy. May his memory be, may his memory be blessed as he is no longer with us. Much love and much respect to his children, all of his sons and all of his daughters, many of whom I personally know for now 30 years. Cohen Levy had such an impact in the Israelite community that, man, I mean, if I'm going to say names, man, I got to give you guys visuals, man. I, I'm not going to half step this. Do y'all mind me really talking to y'all? Because I could tell you right now, this is going to be one of those live streams that you don't want to miss. This is going to be one of those live streams that you don't want to miss. So if I'm going to call names, I think I should give you guys a visual. And so that's what I'm gonna do. All right, I'm gonna give you guys a visual. Let me just search through real quick, try to find some things, because I wanna give you guys a visual, man. I came up under some very, very powerful elders, leaders and teachers in the Israelite community. Very, very powerful. I wanna show y'all the legacy and the lineage that I come from as I share my screen. When y'all can see my screen, let me know. When everybody can see my screen, please let me know. When y'all can see my screen, let me know. I got a lot to show tonight. I got a lot to say tonight. When well, y'all can see my screen, let me know. By the way, family, if you're enjoying this live stream, if you're enjoying this live stream, thumb up the video, share the live stream, hit that donate button as well, family. Show your love. Hit that donate button as well. Huh? Hit that donate button as well. Support. Make sure we support. We all we got, so make sure we support. I seen somebody throw up the name Chief Simeon. Huh? Chief Simeon was such a mighty man of Yah. The man's name ring bells in the Israelite community. Also going back to the 1960s for him. And all throughout America and even the Caribbean, Chief Simeon's name rings bells. Chief Simeon began his Israelite awareness not in New York City, but in Chicago. Shout out to Benai Zakim, headed by Nasi Yahov. Huh? I'm going to give y'all some lineage today. And I'm going to give y'all some history today. I'm going to speak about people who precede me. Some of the people I mentioned I haven't even met. But with respect to Chief Simeon, not only have I met him, but We've had some amazing dialogues, some amazing dialogues, and the, the respect level that we have for each other runs deep, runs deep. And uh, he is also no longer with us, so shout out to our beloved elder, Chief Simeon of Benai Zakim, from Chicago all the way to New York. Shout out to the Chief Simeon. To show you how many people have been impacted by this message, let me just throw some names out there real quick. How many of y'all know this podcast personality that's on my screen in the next 10 seconds? How many of y'all know this podcast personality? If y'all know who this guy is that I got on my screen, 
I want everybody to put his name in the chat room, and I want y'all to put some fire emojis in the chat room. If y'all know who this podcaster is, put his name in the chat room, and I want you to put some fire emojis in the chat room. I want to talk to y'all for a second about influence. I'm going to talk to y'all for a second about influence. Because shout out to the homie, Matt Hoffa. I should call him live on the air. I should call him live on the air. But I want to say, I want to say some things before I do that. All right? Shout out to the big homie. Math, if you watching, call my phone. Math, if you watching, call my phone. I'm live on the air. But I got a lot to say. So if you watching math, I'm live on the air. Call my phone. All right. Um, Math Hoffa, you guys know him from the battle rap world, right? Some of y'all know him from fist fights that he's had in the battle rap world, huh? Math was a beast in the battle rap world. He was also somebody that would put hands and feet on you if necessary. Uh, myself and Math are around the same age. I'm a, I'm a couple months older than him, almost a full year. Um, and we share something in common because it's a particular teacher that he learned from that had a great impact on my life. And that teacher's name is none other than Chief Simeon. Chief Simeon Ben Yehuda. One of our generals in the Israelite movement going all the way back to the 1960s. Let Math Hoffa tell you that he learned discipline and organization from Chief Simeon Ben Yehuda. So for those of you who may not know, there was a time when Math Hoffa was in the Israelite movement. There was a time when Math Hoffa was in the Israelite movement. He was in Israel. He still is in Israel. Still is in Israel. All right? He still is in Israel. Let me see if I could... Um, I want to play something, but I don't want to get... I don't want to get flagged by Vlad TV. I don't want Vlad TV to flag me. But I'll, I'll show y'all the video. Literally, just show it to you. For those of you who don't know that Matt Hoffa was in the Israeli community, I want everybody to just look at my screen real quick. Matt Hoffa on joining the Black Hebrew Israelites after seeing someone get shot in front of him. This interview. Math Hoffa mentions one of the greatest Israelite teachers that have had an impact on me going back to the 90s. He mentions Chief Simeon in this video. You'll hear him speak about an elder named Simeon that, that impacted him. And he followed Simeon. We're talking about none other than the Chief Simeon, Ben Yehuda, one of the generals going all the way back to the 1960s in the Israelite community here in New York and all the way in Chicago. All the way in Chicago. We give y'all a little bit of history. Just a little bit of history. Just a little bit of history. Let me unshare the screen because I have a lot to say. So now let me show you guys this real quick. The buildup is necessary because the buildup is going to take me somewhere real powerful. So I want you guys to take a look at this. So the Israelite movement here in New York City, I'm aware of Prophet Chelly, right? I'm aware of Crowdy. Right, I'm aware of the holiness movement, right? But the Israelite movement in New York City begins essentially with this man right here, this great elder and leader. We call him Chief Rabbi 
Wentworth A. Matthew, Arthur Wentworth Matthew, otherwise known as Rabbi Matthews. He was the protege of a rabbi that came even before him. That rabbi's name is Rabbi Arnold J. Ford. Arnold J. Ford, also known as Arnold Josiah Ford. Arnold Josiah Ford was at one time a founding member of the UNIA. Who in the chat room can tell me what the UNIA is and who their most famous founding member is? I'm going to give you guys some history today. I want somebody to tell me what the UNIA is and who is their most famous founding member. I want y'all to tell me. That's right. That's right. We're speaking of none other than the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. The Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. So Rabbi Ford was a personal friend, brother, confidant, and founding member of the UNIA alongside of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, as well as Rabbi Matthews. One day I'm gonna go live from the Schomburg Museum in Harlem, and I'm gonna take you guys through as much as I can because much of that archive is concealed. They don't allow it to be broadcast. But as much as I can, I'm gonna go through the archives of Rabbi Matthews. I'm gonna go through the archives of Marcus Garvey, which some are still at the Schomburg Museum in Harlem. And I'm gonna show you guys just how many black Jews and Israelites were founding members. We talk about foundational members, founding members, foundational members of the UNIA the Universal Negro Improvement Association, headed by Marcus Messiah Garvey. When you go through the names of the people that had prominent positions in the UNIA, many of them were black Jews. Many of them were Israelites. Don't ever forget the role that the Israelites in Harlem in New York City played towards the advancement of the UNRA. Don't you ever forget that. I'm going to give y'all some history today. I'm going to give y'all some history today. All right? Let me go down the line as a shout out to Chief Rabbi Levy Ben Levy. Chief Rabbi Ben Levy Ben Levy. Now, some of you may not know who Rabbi Ben Levy is, but allow me to say this to you. By a show of ones in the chat room, how many of you know who? Hmm, Dr. Bennis. By a show of ones in the chat room, how many of you know exactly who Dr. Ben is? If y'all know who Dr. Ben is, I want to see something real quick. Who knows who Dr. Ben is? And I don't want you to tell me Dr. Ben. I want you to write his full Hebrew name in the chat room. I want to see if y'all really know who Dr. Ben is. Right? Who is Dr. Ben? Hmm? Somebody put Dr. Ben's full Hebrew name in the chat. Because everybody just knows him as Dr. Ben. They be trying to shorten his name like we, like we ashamed of, of his Hebraic roots. No, we're not afraid of his Hebraic roots. He wasn't afraid of his, his Hebraic roots. Every chance he got, he reminded people of his Hebraic roots. I mean, need I remind y'all, don't forget, Dr. Ben is the one that wrote, We the Black Jews. I got y'all undivided attention. 
don't you forget that Dr. Ben is the one that writes, we, the black Jews. Do I have y'all attention? Huh? Don't forget, he wasn't afraid of his engraved roots. No, he wasn't. So I have something to say. In 1977, In 1977, Dr. Ben, Percy Sutton, and several others were in attendance as Dr. Ben received a cap and gown from none other than the Israelite Rabbinical Academy. Do I have you guys? Undivided attention. Do I have you guys undivided attention? And just in case there's somebody out there thinking that I'm not really telling the history, let me show y'all something real quick. Because one thing about me, I'm gonna have receipts ready. When y'all can see my screen, I'm gonna go to work. Can everybody see my screen? Now, y'all can see my screen. I'm going to go to work. We're going to get a history lesson today, y'all. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. So, the Israelite Rabbinical Academy has been around, has been around for a very, very long time. Very, very, very long time. I'm not sure of the exact date, but I could tell you the Israelite Academy has been around well over 70 years. Well over 70 years. I didn't say the Black Jew Rabbinical Academy. I didn't say the Black Jewish Rabbinical Academy because I'm sure y'all could see with your own eyes the Israelite Rabbinical Academy. Y'all better talk to me today. Oh, y'all better talk to me today. Because I'm going to give you some history. I'm going to give you some history. In 1977, I want to read something to you guys real quick. The Honorable Percy Sutton was a long life champion. This is Percy Sutton, by the way, speaking in front of the podium, which reads Israelite Rabbinical Academy Class of 1977. There's a reason why I have this particular image up, because there's something I want to show you guys about Dr. Ben in relation to this year and the Israelite Rabbinical Academy. So I want everybody to walk with me real quick. The Honorable Percy Sutton was a lifelong champion for the cause of justice and a loyal friend to the Israelite community. President Barack Obama described him as a true hero to African Americans in New York City and around the country. This is also a man that had an amazing relationship with the Israelite community here in New York City, the very community that I come from. Percy Sutton, he was the youngest of 15 children who went on to become a Tuskegee Airman during World War II. If you guys remember, in the infamous Tuskegee Airmen incident, the United States of America, unbeknownst to these men, gave them syphilis because they wanted to test the effects on them. They gave these men to uh, syphilis, right? Make sure you guys are aware of this history. Be aware. Many of you are aware of current events and some old events. But don't ever forget what this country did with the Tuskegee Airmen. All right? I'm not going to go into all of it now. I will do a live stream one day going into black history. That's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. I do that in my classes periodically. But I'm going to do that live on YouTube for you guys very soon. So Percy Sutton was a part of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. He was president of the New York branch of the NAACP, 
And Percy Sutton was also a civil rights lawyer who supported Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he was the personal attorney to Malcolm X. So in case you guys don't understand the dynamic of Percy Sutton and his relationship to the Israelite community, he was the personal attorney to Malcolm X. If nothing else impressed you about his resume, I know we all love us some Malcolm X. Well, Percy Sutton, who had an amazing relationship with the Israelite community, was the personal attorney of Malcolm X. This might be, this might be the reason why Paco and Levy was supposed to meet up with Malcolm X one week before Malcolm died. I'm going to give you some history today. Exactly one week before the death of Malcolm X, he was supposed to meet up with an Israelite elder that I'm going to be showing you shortly in this live stream, Cohen Levy. Malcolm X never denied that he was an Israelite. Not only that, when Malcolm X left the nation of Islam, he began to have several meetings with Israelites here in New York City, but y'all don't hear me. I'm gonna give y'all the history today. And shout out to our elder who's in the hospital right now. Our prayers go out to this elder. Dr. Professor James Small is in the hospital. Everybody throw some fire emojis in the chat room for our elder, Dr. Professor James Small. Put some respect on his name. He was a personal security guard to Malcolm X. We hope that he comes home swiftly and we hope that he is safe. We hope that the creator be with our brother, our elder, Professor James Smalls. There's a reason why I'm bringing up his name, because he could co-sign every single thing I'm telling you right now. The relationship that Malcolm X had with the Israelite community here in New York City. Dr. James Small, Professor James Small could tell you, just like he told me in person to my face, the very first time I met him in person, during my debate with Shaka Amos. Let him tell you about the relationship that Marcus Garvey had with the Israelite community. Let Professor Smalls tell you about the relationship that Malcolm X had with the Israelite community here in New York City. Exactly one week before Malcolm X died, he was supposed to meet up with Cohen Reverend. The Israelite community here in New York City believes had that meeting took place, things would have been astronomically different for our people. Because Malcolm was on the verge of becoming not only inspired by the Israelite community because he was already inspired, but I believe, as many in our community believe, motivated to come out and proclaim his identity not just in talk as he has in the past, but in walk, to actually come out and begin to walk and live this way of life. That is what we believe here in New York City. So shout out to Malcolm X as well. I'm going to give you guys some history on today's live. I didn't come in the Israelite community yesterday, y'all. As of this February, it will be 30 years that I have been in the Israelite community. And I've seen and witnessed a lot and I've heard a lot, so I could tell you a whole lot. I could tell you a whole lot. They say when an elder dies, a library goes with them. I've watched several Israelite elders leave. Elders that I sat under, but I'm going to tell you right now, their library ain't went nowhere. Because some of us got photographic memories and could remember verbatim everything that we were told by our beloved elders. So, so long as their message survives in us, their library did not go away. It still lives and breathes in us. So let me read this to you. As a black entrepreneur, Mr. Sutton founded Inner City Broadcasting, which owns WLIB, the first black owned radio station in New York City 
and WBLS. The first black-owned radio station in New York City, by the way, guys, was the conglomeration of the African Americans here in New York City, as well as the, commu the Caribbean community here in New York City. For anybody who's listening to this live stream that lives in New York City, you know when you wanted to hear reggae on the radio, you could not turn on an FM station. I'm talking before Hot 97. I'm talking way before Power 1051. Those two Johnny Come Lately stations in New York City. We had WLIB. When you wanted to hear reggae music, soca music, Caribbean music, you didn't go and put on no FM station. You listen to WLIB. You listen to people like Gil Bailey, huh? Jamaican born and bred. You listen to Pat McKay. You listen to who we call Ruboy David Levy. By the way, by the way, by the way. How many of you know David Levy from 98.7 that has been involved in the reggae community here in New York City for 40 plus years now? How many of you remember the Ruboy? David Levy. Well, David Levy was raised by an Israelite family. That is Rabbi Levy Ben Levy, who I mentioned earlier. When David Levy immigrated from Barbados and came to New York City, he lived with um, Rabbi Levy Ben Levy, who was pictured. In this picture I'm about to show you in a couple of moments. All right, well, let me move on. So much history, guys. So much history. If I was to go into all the history, I couldn't get to me and Divine Prospect. I couldn't get to me and Divine Prospect. By the way, somebody get in contact with Divine Prospect and get him on this live stream. By the way, somebody get in contact with Divine Prospect and get him on this live stream. I'm gonna take the link to the live stream. And I'm going to put it in the chat. And I only want to be joined by Divine Prospect. If you are not Divine Prospect and you try to join the chat, I will block you from the chat with all due respect. With all due respect, I will block you from the chat. I want to see Divine Prospect in the building. Somebody bring our good brother in the building. I have a lot that I want to say. So watch this. Mr. Sutton's long association with the Israelite community predates his celebrity. In his touching tribute to Chief Rabbi Matthews, Mr. Sutton reminded us that Rabbi Matthew was not only the founder of our community, he was Harlem's rabbi. Mr. Sutton affectionately recalled that when he first ran for office, listen to the years, y'all, 1954, he lost every race year after year, until he was elected in the New York State Assembly in 1964. During that difficult period, Rabbi Matthews was there with him as a master teacher and master organizer, as Mr. Sutton described it, with Rabbi Matthew, I became a winner. I hope I got y'all undivided attention. I really do hope that I have y'all undivided attention. Because somebody got to give y'all the history. There's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot that I want to show. So here we go. Somebody put an APB out on Divine Prospect. Somebody put an APB out on Divine Prospect and get him in the building. We want Divine Prospect in the building. There's a lot that I want to say to the brother. There's a lot that I'm going to show. Here we go. In 1966, Mr. Sutton became the Manhattan Borough President until 1977. One of his official acts as Borough President was to issue a proclamation making June 23rd Chief Rabbi Matthew Day. What, what, what work the Israelites got? What, what, what the conscious community said? What work the Israelites got? The Israelites, all they do is curse people in the streets and in the corner. What, what work the Israelites got? What work we got? Were y'all out y'all cock-picking mine? Malcolm X was inspired 
by the early Israelite movement and had great relationships with our elders. Are y'all crazy? Are y'all insane? I'm going to talk to you real quick. Fix your face. Watch your mouth. I'm going to talk to you real quick. June 23rd was celebrated as Chief Rabbi Matthew Day, an Israelite rabbi here in New York City. Let me talk to y'all real quick. Check the date. Let me continue. Mr. Sutton and his protégés, Congress Charles Rangel, and the late Basil Patterson, father of New York Governor David Patterson, were frequent visitors to where? Commandment Keepers Congregation. Oh, you mean that congregation in Harlem, headed by Rabbi Matthews, the Commandment Keepers. In 1973, Mr. Sutton supported Abraham Dean for mayor against Herbin Badillo, a popular Hispanic candidate. Many people felt that Sutton's support of Beam was never properly appreciated or reciprocated. However, the support of Black Jews for Sutton was unwavering, and Sutton never forgot that we were there for him. In 1977, Percy Sutton ran for mayor of New York City, thereby paving the way for David Dinkins' successful bid in the year 1990. Now, I want everybody to pay close attention to this. Chief Rabbi Levy Ben Levy, the man who became a stepfather to David Levy, rude boy David Levy, invited Percy Sutton to Beth Shalom in Brooklyn to speak at the ordination of the Israelite rabbinical Academy class of 1977. I need y'all undivided attention as I'm about to read a name. I need y'all undivided attention as I'm about to read a name. Well, there's several names that I'm going to read, but there's this one particular name I'm going to need y'all to really listen, listen to. I'm going to really need y'all to listen, listen to. Oh, man. He said, I'm here now. Oh, he got to enter the stage. He got to enter the stage, my brother. If you're free, my brother, please enter the stage. Shout out to our brother. I think we can now say, you know, my ears beat to the streets and what's going on. I think we can say Dr. Divine Prospect. If you are there, Dr. Divine Prospect, hit that um, link to join the live stream as it would be an honor for you to uh, join the stage as um, I say something to you publicly, and I say something before the people community publicly. All right. So I want to read something to y'all. I see him. I see him. Let me unshare the screen for a moment and just do the honors real quick. As I literally say, peace, love, and shalom to our brother, your brother. Oh, oh. I, 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 oh man. Oh, I know another Rob Zafone. I don't think that this was Divine Prospect. Rob Zafone, we, we need Divine Prospect to join the building. All right, we want Divine Prospect to join the building. My, my apologies. My apologies. We want Divine Prospect. I'm not going to block you, Rob Zafone, but I'm, I only want Divine Prospect on the stage for the moment. I really want Divine Prospect on the stage for the moment. I'm going to reshare the link and ask that our brother join us. Because I have a lot of history to give y'all. And I also have something I want to publicly say to the brother. And here's where things are going to get real interesting. So as soon as Divine, moderators, can y'all repost the link so Divine can see it too? I just reposted it in the chat room, but moderators, can you please repost the link so that Divine can join the chat, all right? So you can join the chat. Got to say something publicly. This is perhaps going to be one of, if not the most powerful live stream I do this year. Wait on it. 
I got a lot to say. Wait on it. I got a lot to say. So as we're waiting for um Divine Prospect to join the live stream, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the link in there one more time. I'm not sure. I'll put the link in there one more time. Um, in fact, let me see if I could um let me see if I could pin. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. All right, all right. All right. Come on. Come on, huh? What's going on, man? Let's go. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. How you doing, Dr. Divine Prospect? How are you? I'm doing good, more right? How you doing? I'm doing very good, my brother. It's been a long time coming, man. Yes, sir. Coming, man. Um, just kind of filling in the people with our um, lineage and how long I knew you. And, um, you know, bringing up that we first met around uh, Kevin on trial, which goes back to 2013. That was our introduction to one another. While we did not know each other very well, uh, from that moment to this day, there was always mutual respect. We've had some bumps, we've had some slip ups, but one of the things I've said earlier was that even amidst the differences that we had, uh, we've always remained amicable and friendly, and we never tried to bring it to the forefront. And I said that there was, and I, I, I want you to hear this because I know you weren't here um, when I said this earlier, but I want you to know that I definitely said to the people that there was this one time where I went off and had some words for you live on Sarnetta, and while I don't want to use the word regret, I do want to say I am unhappy with my behavior and the way in which I treated our differences because differences will always occur with brothers and if there's a personal issue then personal issues deserve a personal space and not a public platform correct and so i, I say to you openly before the people i apologize to you for that oh yeah i already forgave you more i was just waiting to hear back from you <laughs> you know what much, i mean so much, yeah and, and anything i've you. done anything i've done to contribute to that you know what i'm saying i apologize to you as well you know what i'm saying i never wanted our friendship to be severed like this because there's a lot of good that we can do in unity together, like we see in Tending 133, um, as brothers, you know what I'm saying, as Achim, you know what I mean, and, and anything other than that is just something that the ops want us to beef, you know what I mean, so we don't come together and do That's something great for y'all, you know what I mean, so, I mean, That's that time is over, you know, we're here where we're here right now, um, more power to you, my brother, and um, yeah, I'm here, man, I'm going to ride as long as I can. You know, I'm multitasking, but yeah, I support what you're doing on this show, man, and the history you're giving and everything like that. So keep it coming, uh, Moray. All right, all right. So I'm going to go in a little bit and say some things. Um, Divine Prospect, this might sound a little funny, Divine. You might laugh. <laughs> Divine used to be, used to be, I put that in past tense, my favorite messianic. But I don't know if I could say that anymore. Because <laughs> you crossed the line. Because I crossed the line. <laughs> Devon, I, I, I want to get a live reaction from you, Devon. When, when, let me, or let, if hold on. I, let, let me let me park real quick. I got you. Okay. Hold on. Okay, take your time, man. Take your time. All right, you got it. Okay. I don't know for a fact that you heard us. Let me first at least ask you Did you hear yet that I had transitioned and moved from my views in being? conceived of as a non-messianic Israelite, are you aware that I no longer hold to that label, that I absolutely believe that Yeshua is the Messiah? Are you aware of that? Of course. You stirred up so much. Who who didn't hear it? You know what I mean? So if the walls right. can speak, they would tell it. You know what I mean? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> much love, man. So I want to... I want to get for a moment just your reaction, right? I, I, for you, anybody else, I would say, tell us your genuine reaction. But from my experience with you, I don't need to use the word genuine because that's always uh, the way I've seen you. Even when you needed to disagree, you, you, you disagreed. So I always considered you genuine. So if you can, give us what was your live impression and reaction when you first began to hear that news? What was your thoughts? And I mean, put it in terms where we can really understand the impact because you remember at one time not only was i non-messianic but i was the soul of tarsus that would come and attack the messianic community and sometimes use some very dirty tactics to do so i'm gonna be honest and i keep it real and so in light of all of that 
what was your initial reaction in, in hearing uh, some of this news? Um, I wasn't surprised. Um, and I say that because you've always given hints over the years. You know what I'm saying? People just wasn't astute enough to pick them up. You know what I'm saying? So you left breadcrumbs along the hill, like Hansel and Gretel. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm not surprised when I heard it. I was a little shocked because of the timing. I didn't think it would be this soon, but I wasn't, I wasn't taken back completely. You know what I'm saying? Because I know you've said things over the years from watching, you know, lectures that you've done, content on your channel, hearing you in person. So you, you was already transitioning in that direction. Um, it's just that when you openly came out, my first thoughts was a lot of people is going to reject Zion. You know what I'm saying? Because of that. Because you, your name would come up when people would champion you know what I'm saying, just Tanakh only, you know what I'm saying, like, your name would come up, you know what I'm saying, and those very people now got to reconsider and say, damn, if, if Zion sees this, what am I missing, right, mm -hmm. I know about three or four good brothers, um, strong brothers in the truth, who, you know, who, would, who didn't deal with anything to deal with the issue or anything along those lines, um, come back and tell me, like, yo, man, you know, Devon, you know, Devon I just saw this video by Zion, and he started breaking out Zay 53 and this, this, and that, I'm like, okay. You know, they say it to me like, I'm going to be shocked. I'm like, okay. I was already expecting that. They said, yeah, man. I went back to go look at his video, and all the points I was making was right. And I was saying all this stuff all these years. I said, listen, man, this is a, a, a growing walk. This is not nothing that you can stay stagnant in one year, two year, three. If you look the same when I met you back in 2014, mm. and now, that's, that's a problem. problem. A I've known you, what, nine years now. That's Ten crazy. years, 2013. Oh, 10 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, from Hebrew War Machine and all of that, it's been a long time. Long, you know what I'm saying? Time. Yeah, so so when people when people see that, again, a lot of it could be because others wanted you to be the frontline soldier for their agenda, right? And I'm not going to say no names. And, and I respect a lot of those people, too, but they were using you as a frontline soldier in a, in a battle. You know what I'm saying? And right. it's unfortunate, but I knew after a while, once you once you came to establish your own footing, you know what I'm saying, and you was you kind of tuned out the white noise to focus in, that you would see something very similar. You know what I mean? So, like, even my position on New Testament is unconventional. You know what I'm saying? People that, that understand what my position is. So it's, it's oh, yours is kind of similar, which is interesting. It is not the traditional position, but it's one that is outside the box. And, right. and I honor those type of outlooks on it. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the only thing that's going to allow us to drive forward so we can meet at the middle pass. You know what I mean? So um, that's how I felt. Yeah, I was I'm, I was happy. I was like, okay, this is this is good. The brother's making progress. Not like you wasn't making progress. Right. You got the Medu Netcha and other things as well. I mean, you this is something that you've been already tacking onto your resume over time. And I was like, well, let me see, like, after some time, if the brother goes back and reexamine it and you did just that. So whatever you lost and – Brotherhood from anybody that may disagree with you, you've gained ten times. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're riding with you on this, my brother, and I and I appreciate your honesty, transparency, and your scholarship like always. Thank you, man. Thank you. I wanna now use the opportunity and this powerful moment to seize the moment and, and, and do something um, that a lot of people he fell off on the live stream. Hopefully we won't have him jump back in. Uh, I'm gonna post the link back in there. I know he is moving. I post the link back in there so that he can join back because I wanted to actually be able to say this while he was on live. I wanted to I wanted to look at him as I'm saying this. Devon lives in Georgia. I live in New York City, but Devon is from Devon is from um New York City. Devon is from New York City. So we have a lot in common. We have a lot in common with him. You and his brother have a lot in common. There you go. There you go. So, my bad. I hit, I hit the wrong button. My bad. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I, I want to kind of seize this moment because this is a very rare moment. It's very rare when me and you are on the same live stream. That, that's, that's very rare. And um, I want to seize the moment and say something to you, man. Um, we talk about in the community divide about wanting to lead by example and wanting to teach by example. And for the most part, it's wordplay, right? Let's just be honest, it's wordplay. People are saying, oh, I'm, I'm gonna lead by example, but when you really look at people, are you leading by example, are you teaching by example? Most people aren't really doing that. It sounds good, it's a great conversation piece, but people aren't really doing it. 
I want to say something to you, Divine. There was things that you said, and I want to share my screen for you because I'm really going to talk not just to you, but to the community on this. So I'm going to have something on the screen that's going to be interesting. When people see the screen, it's going to bring us back to a moment. So here we go. You remember this sit-down, Divine? Oh, yeah, of course. There was things that Divine said. Number one, this discussion between myself, Shema Israel, um, against or with Divine Priest Daniela and Hurricane Ashar, Divine Prospect, um, this changed my view about what it is to be a messianic Israelite. Because I want to admit that my congregation really must have thought that you guys were Christian Israelites. We had no clue about the things that you accepted and rejected, which is why there were several times in this particular discussion that were, there were things that we brought up that really had no place in this discussion because you guys didn't even believe in it. So we were treating you like you were a Christian, just an Israelite. So we come in with the wrong arguments. So I, I couldn't see myself having divine prospect on my platform without being able to say this publicly. You are all the way right, divine. And I'm gonna be very specific because this video I have up is very specific. I labeled this particular video that I cut and edited from that discussion, I labeled it Zion, Lex, and Divine Prospect on Buddha Tony. And I remember arguing and debating to the best of my ability against Divine primarily that atonement can be made through prayer and, you know, and repentance and th those things are precursors and they're necessary, but Divine was adamant. Divine said, I hear you, I hear you, Zion, but do you not also acknowledge that the Tanakh tells you it is the blood that atones? Mm. I'm going to tell you right now, brother. Um, I didn't do it immediately after the debate or the discussion finished. A couple of years later, I went back and I looked at this particular discussion because of my newfound views from research. Now I'm trying to center my, my understanding properly. So I'm revisiting conversations that I even have with you. And this particular conversation really moved me based on what you said. You continually emphasize that Zion, I'm not saying that atonement uh, does not require repentance and that atonement does not require sincere prayer. But I am also telling you, Zion, that atonement is from the blood, the shedding of blood. And you brought several passages I'm about to play this live stream. It's only about 15 minutes short. I'm going to play what I said, and I'm going to correct everything I said that was wrong, which basically was a good a good 75% of what I said was wrong. And you, you'll understand what I mean, not you, but the community will understand what yeah. I mean was wrong, because it's not that what I was saying was entirely wrong. I wasn't accounting for the most important thing which was that blood atonement. That was the most important thing that I forgot. And I want to use this moment as a teaching moment because um, what a lot of people fail to realize is the role that bias plays in blocking and marring us from seeing truth. Obviously, I walked into this, this discussion with a, with, a, with a bias. And my bias was this New Testament is not real. I was the only one on the panel that believed that Yeshua existed because, as you know, in my community, my school doesn't even believe he exists. You know. Correct. That. And That's I was correct. the only one on the panel that actually held that view. I also held a view at that time that he was a great teacher, a great scholar, yep. and maybe even a prophet. But I did not see him as the Messiah, and I certainly correct. didn't see his death as a sacrificial atonement on behalf of Israel, something that not only do I fully support, but would, de would defend with all I got today. Mm -hmm. Defend with all I got today against anybody and a mama. Right? So I'm going I'm to I'm play some of this divine. And if necessary, if you want to point some things out and have me stop it, I'll do it. Do I have your permission? Okay. Yeah, definitely. You got it, King. Damn. All 
All right, so here we go. I hope you guys enjoy this. This is monumental. Hopefully something like this becomes a standard in our community. Why are we so great that we can't be humble? One of my teachers that passed years ago, Chief of Chief, Chief Naftali, he said, the greater thou art, the more humble thou should be. The greater thou art, the more humble thou should be. So why are we so great that we are really humble? Is it too big of a thing for a man to say I was wrong? I'm gonna tell y'all one thing about me that I also believe that Divine holds and many other people in our community hold. I'm not gonna say sorry privately and then don't say it publicly. I'm not gonna tell my good brother Divine Prospect I was wrong privately, but can't tell y'all publicly. And we gonna talk about it live because it shouldn't be a shame to say I was wrong. It's part of growth. You cannot grow if you cannot admit that I am wrong. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is 100%. If you cannot admit publicly, everybody does it privately. If more people did it publicly, we would see more humility in the community. And so if we're leaders, we're going to really lead by example. I'm going to tell you right now, I was dead wrong. And here we go. No, no. Oh, you have a question you want to ask? Okay. All right, so I, I'll, I'll ask my first question. My first question is this, and this is uh, to the panel here and to my brothers over here. For my Tanakh-only brothers, my non messianic brothers, brothers, my question is this. What is the model of atonement now that we are in a diaspora without a temple, without a Levitical priesthood, and without a sacrifice? What is the model for atonement that... Uh, my brothers have to not only what is the model for atonement and can you show it within the scriptures the by the way y'all we literally giving y'all history because the year is 2015. yeah there, there are israelites watching this live stream right now that didn't even know what an israelite was in 2015. so at the least bit guys put some respect on the fact that we are some of many individuals that have been putting in work in the community for a very long time and we should always pay respect to those who in part help to pave the way to create a voice and a platform for us today. I pay homage to my elders of past and present because I know for a fact they're in part responsible for my voice today. And we should always honor that. Model for atonement that we have today being that we're out of our land, we have no sacrifice, no temple, and no Levitical priesthood. Was that a serious question? Oh, no, I was, okay. No, 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 that's Torah or the Pentateuch. I'm, yeah, Tanakh only means we're going from Bereshit to Malchai. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, so, no, no problem. <laughs> so from Bereshit. By the way, Devon, if I could be a little breezy, is, as you can see the smile on my face, I laughed when he said that, because what do you mean, what is the Torah? <laughs> <laughs> I laugh, man. I, and just so you know, it's real. You can literally look at my face and see me laughing as he said it. What I'm really trying to say is, Devon, I understood what you said. I don't know what he's saying, but I understood Devon. <laughs> no temple and no Levitical priesthood. <laughs> was that a serious question? Oh, no, I was, okay. No, 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 no. That's Torah or the Pentateuch. I'm, yeah, Tanakh only means we're going from Bereshit to Malchai. Okay, gotcha. If y'all can see my smile, the smile says it all. Listen, it's going to be one of them real moments that I'm going to tell you guys everything. I'm going to keep it so real. It's not even funny. I did not co-sign what he said at all. I thought it was a little silly. But, you know, when you when you rep for the team, you rep for the team, right? That was a brother uh, known as Chief Yashar. Right, a, a good brother uh, uh, in his own right. Respect to him. He's of Shema Israel. But respectfully, um, I, I agree with what he said. I was clear on what Divine said. So as y'all can see in my smile, I kind of had to sit back like, uh, we already starting off on the wrong foot because you ain't making us look good with that question, bro. But here we go. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. So no, no problem. <laughs> so from Bereshit to Malachi, I'm, I'm asking within that genre of text right there, that corpus of text, what is the system or the model or the paradigm for atonement being that we're in a diaspora out of the land, we have no temple, we have no Levitical priesthood, and that there's no 
sacrifices according to the Tanakh. Now listen to my little haughty, arrogant self as I attempt to answer his question, which was a, a damn good question he asked. And um, there was a measure of arrogance on my side because uh, I needed to remind myself throughout this dialogue of, of how many years I had and how well experienced I was. And you know, guys, to be honest, sometimes when you've been doing something for so long and you've been hearing people put so much respect on your name for so long that you start to become full of yourself. What, what a lot of people don't know, what the people in my temple know, from the age 16, I was a prodigy, not just in my temple, but in the Israelite community. I had created a name in the Israelite community, but especially in my temple since I was 16 years old. Many of the elders would come up to me and literally say that this young man has the wisdom of Solomon. Guys, when, I don't know about y'all, but when you got people old enough to be your father and your grandfather telling you that, it's hard for your head not to swell. So over the years, I've definitely acquired a measure and degree of arrogance. I'm going to admit that, right? Because I know that in admitting that, it's healing and it's honest and forthright. So you might see some of my arrogance here, and I'm, I'm, I'm unafraid to embrace who I once was, especially because that is no longer who I am. But here we go. Start now. First and foremost, excellent question, because this is some of the things that perplexes the community when we have these discussions. Um, one thing that we love to point out is the idea that what we find concurrent in the messianic uh, ideology or understanding of this particular topic is that your entire model of atonement, of atonement is not based on the Tanakh. Well, well, well let, me fin let, me just, let me just finish, let me finish. What we're saying is the messianic model of atonement is not Tanakh only or, to or i.e. Torah based. Because just now he asked the question, if there is no temple, if there is no priest, we are not in the land. What is your model of atonement? He messed out on the main component of the temple itself. The Torah says, and by Torah, I mean the entire Tanakh. So I'm quoting the book of Isaiah right now, Isaiah. Isaiah says that this shall be called what? A house of what? Prayer for all nations. The temple itself was not designed for sacrifice sacrifice is not the focal point of the temple i'll give it to you very briefly and very eloquently when you go into the temple yes uh Yedidaya, i was in a new york city emt for 10 years uh, i worked in new jersey and i worked in new york um I, I probably shouldn't say the brother's whole name but you probably were speaking with david cook who's now a captain at uh Fidney, the, the fire department uh, ems so yeah, I was an EMT for several years. In fact, um, I know somebody gonna call me the police when I show this, but I'm, I'm honored by my service. So let me just show you guys real quick. So I still even have my EMT badge. The badges that EMTs are issued here in New York City, it looks just like the police badge. So for obvious reasons, I always carry my EMT badge. <laughs> even though I'm retired and no longer an EMT. I know somebody is going to clip this video, take a picture and say, see, Zion's an agent. Zion's an agent, right? The one thing about publicity, they say there's no such thing as bad publicity. So I don't mind. So hold on, hold on. Let, let, let me say this real quick, Zion. So that means you got to X out Daniel from the text. You got to X out Joseph from the text. You got to X out Ezra from the text, Mordecai from the text. All of these people have positions of authority that we will call government as well today. That's which right. Responsible today. So that means that we can't have nobody in position, which unfortunately, let's say, for example, you have in your EMP uh, certification, if somebody in the community had an issue and they needed somebody to attend to them, who are they going to call first? You or are they going to call the man, quote unquote? Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's very ignorant how our people think. And that's unfortunate, and that's why we destroyed the way we are now because brothers don't know how to commend other brothers and sisters 
or leveling up with skill sets that they can bring back and betterment the community. You know what I mean? So. Thank you. You are absolutely right, man. I used to be kind of ashamed to show that. Like there was times that I went to events, debates here in New York City, how or held by Sarnetta. And, um, you know, sometimes you got to show your ID at the door. And so my ID, as you guys can see, it has my badge in it. And people don't read the badge. They just see the badge. And my badge, like I said, it looks just like the NYPD badge. Like when NYPD stops me when I'm driving, they literally say, and I don't correct them, they be like, oh, you on the job? No, go ahead. If I run a red light, I pull out my badge. They be like, no, you're good. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know you were a cop. I don't, I don't correct them. And even some of them who look at the badge and say, oh, you were EMT or where you work? And I tell them, they be like, go ahead. You don't get tickets. So it's, it's honored here. But of course, in our community, we have this notion that if you work in these governmental positions, that you're an agent. But what Devon brought up that I never thought about is impressive because some of the greatest leaders that we had in our era, especially post First Temple era, were people that worked for the government, right? Even our first messianic redeemer, Moses. He's somebody that you could say worked for the government. Right, he worked for the he worked for the man. He worked for the man. <laughs> he worked for the man. You know what I'm saying? And um, it, it's it's an honor, man. But I, I don't want to drag that point. I do want to show this video because I want to be able to correct what I said live. I want to be able to admit that what I was saying was wrong because this is how we grow as a community, and this is also how we heal. I know right now in our era, everybody's using the word heal, especially in relationship. Oh, I'm healing. By the way, sister, healing ain't you going out with 50 people after homeboy. That's not healing, right? <laughs> we see that. And brothers, healing ain't you dating her enemies, brother, brothers, right? But even though healing is mostly spoken in the relationship context, we still have this general conversation today about everybody's trying to heal, somebody's trying to heal. But I think in, in, in terms of our community, the context that I want to put healing in is is to speak towards individuals in our community that lack humility, that can't come out and say, my brother, I apologize, I was wrong. That cannot say, I'm sorry, sister, I, I, I did not mean to do that. If I meant to do that, it was wrong what I did, and I apologize, and that will not happen again. If and when we have more people that do that, then we will see healing and then growth in our community. So this particular live stream is very important for me because it's part of my healing. It's an opportunity to say openly, and, and publicly before my brother that I was wrong and to the community that I was wrong. So let's, let's continue. Well, itself, and you walk into the outer courtyard and you begin to step into what is known as the inner courtyard. What do you approach? The copper altar. Copper is an inferior metal to gold. The copper altar is also known as the altar of sacrifice. When you get into the holy of holies, you approach the golden altar. Gold is more superior to copper. The golden altar is where incense was offered in the Holy of Holies and the high priest prayed before the Almighty God. So, whereas we are deficient today of knowing who the priest is or the high priest is, the only person who can officiate in that service, whereas we are deficient of the temple today and we are no longer in the land today, we still have the focal point which is what Solomon got down on his knees for in 1 Kings chapter 8. And he said that if your people are in the land of their enemies and they stretch out their hands to this house, you will hear and you will forgive them. So to answer your question as to what a template is or what our template is in contradistinction to not having those modalities, those outlets, I will respond like you said with scripture. I'm in the book of Hosea, chapter 14, verse 2, where it says, Return, Israel, <coughs> unto the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. By the way, the word return you use is shuva, which also means repentance in Hebrew. So when we talk about atonement, you have to understand that atonement and repentance is the same thing. Atonement and repentance is the same thing. The word here for re And that right there is incorrect. As I'm sure Divine agrees, and I'm sure he said during this live stream, during that discussion. Atonement is not the exact same thing as repentance. I was wrong. And again, being so strongly and passionately um, 
geared towards your own views creates a bias for what could be true. And so you just can't see it, right? Until you kind of step into a space that is outside of your comfort zone where you begin to think balanced and be able to see clearer, right? Biases create a, an intellectual hedge around our mind that blocks and mars our visions, obscures our ability to see what's true from a balanced point of view. So I was wrong. Um, atonement and repentance is not the same thing. Repentance denotes returning to the Creator by following His will, His decrees, His statutes, His commandments, His judgments, right? That is how we typically would de define briefly the term Teshuvah, right? Repentance. However, you still are required of blood sacrifice, which is literally what divine will go on to say. And that's something that for many years I never tapped into, even though I know I saw it in the book. I know I read it in the book, but I never fully wrapped my mind around it and accepted it because I was taught that that was Christian, even though I was reading it in the tone. And this goes to show what bias can do because you could be looking at something right in a book that you accept and deny it because you think by co-signing it, it would agree with someone's argument. Whenever we have to deny truth because of how we believe that truth will be hidden, we are in the wrong because truth don't need our help, nor does it need us to hide or reveal. Truth will do what it does on its own. And if you're a speaker of truth, then this, just do that. But you never need to dress it up or undress it, let it do what it does. Um, Devon, do you want to comment on that before I, I play a little bit more? Nah, I mean, there's no more to say after that. I mean, you said it all, you know what I'm saying? So I appreciate that. Yep, I agree. All right. The term shuva also was used in the Tanakh for repentance. Shuva literally means to turn or to return. And it's also used in the Tanakh for repent. Follow me. Hosea 14.2 says, Return, Israel, unto the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him, May you forgive our, all our iniquity and accept our goodwill and let our lips substitute for the offering of bullocks. Hallelujah. And even though I didn't know it, Divine is about to rip apart the foundation of my argument. And I actually left this discussion literally saying to myself, and even at times publicly, that I, you know, ran through them. Right? I, 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 like I said, I was on my arrogant train. I'm going to be absolutely honest and admit that. Um, not realizing that Divine is about to rip the foundation from underneath my feet. But being so high on my own arrogance and own stubborn reflection i couldn't even see that the foundation was being ripped from my feet so that my argument had nothing upon which it could stand you know how biased you gotta be to realize that somebody just rendered your entire argument obsolete and actually walk away from the discussion thinking you said something greater so if y'all can't tell i'm keeping it all the way real let's go We still, well, we still have two minutes left, so uh, my apologies. We still have two minutes left, so I'm going to take the entire time. So here's the problem. It is a Christian concept, number one, and this is something that I tried to initiate earlier. It's a Christian concept to think that the atonement model is built on sacrifice. You see, one thing the Torah also makes clear, and by Torah, again, I'm referring to the entire book, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. The one thing the Torah makes clear is this. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. Period. Ezekiel 33 says that righteousness is what will cause a person to be rectified before the Almighty God. Yeah, obedience is greater than sacrifice. God said that. Righteousness saves from death. The Torah says that. Proverbs, yeah. The only problem is obedience and righteousness can't come on the altar of God. <laughs> so Houston, we got a problem. And I'm smiling on the inside. Not because I'm happy to be wrong, but I want everybody to really understand 
You see, to a really spiritual person, being wrong is not hurtful when you really understand that it's clearing a path for you to be right. And that's the most important thing. Being wrong is a matter of ego. Being right is a matter of humility. So in Ezekiel 33, it correctly says, if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does that which is wicked, none of his righteousness shall be remembered on that day. In contradistinction, it also says, and if a wicked man turns and becomes righteous, none of his wickedness shall be remembered on his half. What merited that? A sacrifice or his righteousness? Hence, Psalms chapter 4, verse 5 correctly says, or for the sacrifice of righteousness. There is no sacrifice greater than your own merit earned indeed based on Torah in coming before the Almighty God to show him that you are genuine in your return, i.e. your repentance, i.e. shuva or teshuvah. Well, let me correct myself. Because if that's the case, what's the point of a Yom Kippur ceremony? If my righteousness and my repentance is sufficient for my salvation and being completely forgiven before the Almighty, then what is the point of the Yom Kippur service? What was the point of that blood sacrifice? If all I needed to do was to just do that which is right, to acknowledge the Creator's will and to live and fulfill it wholeheartedly, then what was the purpose of the blood sacrifice? Our biases will put us in a position that renders our intelligence and our God-given wisdom obsolete. And if we don't begin to break down the barriers that our biases create, we will forever be imprisoned in our own arrogance, in our own ego, in our own destruction. So whereas most Christians will tell you that the mode for sacrifice and atonement is built on sacrifice, you don't have a working knowledge of Tanakh to say so. Because if you did, you would never make such a mistake. The altar of incense, which is also the altar of... By, by the way, Devon, if I can remind you, I know that you have to move, God. You, you're clearly driving, right? You just stopped in the road. Oh, no, I, I just... Yeah, I just came back home. I just... I'm in my oh, okay. right now. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, let me say this. So um, um, at any given point, please stop me or have me rewind or forward if, if you want to go to a particular point in this video. I'm gonna, the video is only 16 minutes long. It, it shares what I said, what you said, what I said, you said, and then we end. And at any given point, if you want me to stop to emphasize something I said so you can add or something that you said so you can add, then by all means, let me know. Okay. Will do, brother. All right of prayer is gold it's in the holy of holies the altar of sacrifice is copper it's in the outer courtyard there's no comparison between sacrifice and prayer we're in the land today we don't have temple we don't have priests but guess what we still got we could face the east and pray like king solomon said hallelujah all right so um my brother said that I'm sorry, y'all, but watching this right now, y'all ever watched or pulled out pictures of yourself when you was younger and was like, damn, I look like that? How many of you ever watched a video of yourself from the past and went, damn, I sounded like that? <laughs> That's how I feel, bro. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so I want to say something, though. So with the information that I'm spewing here, again, it's not that what I'm saying is entirely wrong. I'm just missing a big, important component that would really put this all together which makes me dead wrong because once you're missing an important component for something, you, you don't have the whole picture. Yet I'm presenting it as if I have the whole picture. So I just wanted to say uh, in, in short that in just listening to my argument here and knowing what I fully know and embrace now, I can see the folly in my ways. I can see the illusion and spell that I was under. And again, that's what bias does to us. That's why, and I'm, and I'm going to do something that is probably um, unorthodox, because I'm going to definitely credit the conscious community with me becoming a better researcher. Because for many years, 
as an Israelite, something was true because I could find it in Exodus. Something was true because it was stated in Deuteronomy or Isaiah. We were taught to utilize the Torah. We were really taught to corroborate evidence, to compare and contrast. We were really taught how to really do research. We were really taught how to look at something unbiasedly. We were really taught how to approach something with an open mind. And it's all of those aforementioned things that led to why I eventually changed my position completely in now acknowledging that Yeshua is Hamashiach. Prayer is a substitute um, for actual sacrifice. Um, I, I don't want to misquote you. Is that what you said? A oh, repentance? You said prayer. Sure, sure, yeah. Fourteen verse two. Gotcha. Take words with you in return and forgive all their iniquity and let your lips, i.e., prayer, mm -hmm. substitute the sacrifice. This is actually like you said this. Gotcha. All right. So to respond to Hosea, the period of Hosea had to do with the Israelites coming back to the land to reestablish the temple, to also reestablish the city. So if we're having the prophets that are speaking and the Most High speaking through the prophets to the people, the prophets are the ones that are giving the word of encouragement to the people to go and build the temple and the city. If prayer was only sufficient, then you would not have a outer court and you would not have an inner court. There would be no need for that, a sin offering. There would be no need for a burnt offering. There would be no need for any type of offering of sacrifice if you have only prayer. By the way, if, if y'all not understanding what's happening, I'm getting cut. <laughs> Respectfully, I'm getting cut. <laughs> Go ahead, Devon. I'm getting cut right now. <laughs> <It's> funny, <man. laughs> I'm going to keep it real. I'm rewinding this. You know, you know, again, what's funny for me is I've played back this video over the years and I've sat and gloated in my arrogance. Ah, oh, yeah, nothing for me. Yeah. And I've always respected you. I've always respected the world prospect. Yeah, my which, which, which is why I was gloating to myself behind the scenes. Where I'm like, this dude is a beast, buddy. He couldn't handle me. And it, my bias really didn't even let me see that the moment he picked up the mic, I started to get cut. So we, we're going to play back some of the cut, and then we're going to let him finish. The period of Hosea had to do with the Israelites coming back to the land to reestablish the temple, to also reestablish the city. So if we're having the prophets that are speaking and the Most High speaking through the prophets to the people, the prophets are the ones that are giving the word of encouragement to the people to go and build the temple and the city. If prayer was only sufficient, then you would not have a outer court and you would not have an inner court. There would be no need for that, a sin offering. There would be no need for a burnt offering. There would be no need for any type of offering of sacrifice if you have only prayer. The temple would have been designed differently the temple would have been modeled differently. So if a person is praying and then their prayers are accepted and is greater than the sacrifice, then what was quoted in Hosea chapter four, they would have left that part of the temple out because that would be the paradigm or the model for the people to follow and not have to go to a priest. And the high priest would not have to atone once a year for the sins of the people with blood. He had to atone for the sins of the people. Now, when we're talking about repentance, that's one thing. When we're talking about atonement, that's something different. Now, we can see that they correlate. But when we talk about a prayer of repentance, that's just somebody, like you said, to turn, i.e. to turn literally means to turn from your direction to the direction of the most high. Yeah. I want everybody to look at me as divine is talking. Because maybe if I was paying attention, I would have realized that not only was I getting cut, but I was getting, I was being taught. You see, most of us, we... We're not listening to listen. We're listening to respond. So notice that I'm thinking I'm so smart that no matter what he's saying, he's still got to be wrong. So I'm preparing my response. So while I'm preparing my response, notice what's happening. I'm not entirely listening. That's disrespectful. That's not brotherly. And that's not how you listen and learn. Why am I preparing my response while he is sharing his view? That's me and my arrogance saying, 
There's nothing that you could say to correct or counter what I said. Therefore, I'm opening my book just to rebuttal what you're now saying, and I'm not hearing you. And I'm going to keep it real. Because if I don't say that as a respected person, then it paves the way for this behavior that we see in the Israelite community where everybody's just wrong and strong and nobody cares. Enough of that. We want to say, as everybody says, next year in Jerusalem, we want to say that this thing is going to happen and that we're going to go home. But how the hell are we going to go home if we don't have it right right here? Yes, everybody can pray a prayer of repentance, but once that prayer of repentance is done, what is the atonement for sin? There has to be still be an atonement for sin. In Jeremiah chapter 33 and 18, it states there that there will always be a priest. Always be a priest. So I'm going to read that real quick. Uh, or y'all can read it for me. Uh, Je 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 Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah uh, 33 and 18. Yes. And it reads like so. Neither shall the priest, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offering and to kindle meat offering to do sacrifice continual. All right. So we're looking at what's called the imperfect tense in Hebrew. Imperfect tense is an all-going action. Also, depending upon the context that is being re that's being read, I'm how do on time. Um, okay. Um, so when we look at tenses in Hebrew, you have two, two real tenses. You have a perfect tense, which is completed. Then you have an imperfect tense, which is ongoing. It's an action that started at some point in time and is still continuing. But sometimes, depending on context, we can see if it could be a present participle or if it's going to continue to be an ongoing action. That's the mechanics of the language in Hebrew. So the point that I'm trying to make is that the Most High is specifically stating that there will always be somebody before him that will be offering something. So the problem is here, and um, I want to wrap it up with this, and then I think you guys ask a question after this, right? Okay. Is that the atonement process is not always directly correlated with the, uh, the, the repentance process. And the reason why I'm saying this is because if that was the case, there would be no need for a sin offering, no need for a burnt offering. These offerings would be worthless if prayer was necessary and if we're referring back to the context of hosea again they're still going back to rebuild the temple which had an inner and an outer court with the altar of sacrifice all right this is the reason why every single time i have something to say about divine privately and publicly it's always words of praise again even in the midst of us having slight hiccups here and there and me being in my feelings about something here and there. Um, I've always publicly given him respect and he's always also done the same. Um, sometimes we could lose out on having a really powerful person among us because we don't properly care for and love that person entirely. Because we wait for one slip of one thing we don't like and now we're not cool. Now we gotta hear something out publicly. That's not brotherly. That's not love, and I'm not doing that anymore with anybody. Um, my main objective in the Israelite community, especially since I've came to the stage in the last 10 years, was to deal with people that come to the Bible. Most of the debates you guys see me in is against people who attack the whole Bible because I say to myself, I don't want to debate Israelites. That's not because I don't believe that we have differences that can be ironed out. But I believe that those differences should be handled mostly behind closed doors so that our laundry is not pulled out before the public. And so um, this is all a learning experience for me. I'm enjoying this moment, and I already know what comes from this. And it's going to be through the will of the Creator that I believe that me and this good brother here, Devon Prospect, will go on by God's uh, will to do something very impactful and very amazing in the community. And I also want to say this because I wouldn't be me if I didn't say this. If you are still teaching in 2023 that Yeshua didn't exist, you have a problem. If you are still teaching in 2023 that there's no credible or meritable information for Yeshua being the Mashiach, you're going to have a problem. Because people like us is going to be very I am going to spend the rest of my natural life 
in the same way that I fought against him, I'm going to spend the rest of my natural life defending him. And all I can say is to those who are the opposing end, ready or not, here we come. Right. So the high priest is still going in once a year to make atonement for sins with blood. So you still have some degree of sacrifice, even in the midst of repentance and prayer. And I'll end with that. You guys do. Yeah, start the time. So the first thing I want to make clear is this. So now we're at the point where we're talking about textual criticism, which is going to lead to our second question. But I'm going to first just take 30 seconds myself to rebuttal to your last statements, and he's also going to rebuttal, um, which means that we're essentially giving you some of our time because I'm only going to take 30 seconds, and then he's going to share the remainder, and it's going to turn over to uh, us asking the question because it's our turn to ask the question. So, By the way, put some respect on his name. That is our brother Shemuel. His father is a great uh, elder in the Israelite community. His name is Chief Hezekiah. Shemuel, seen here pouring the water for all of the brothers in the video. I hope everybody doesn't think that this is the water work for the temple, the water work for the congregation. This was a three time New York City Golden Glove champion. He trained with Marcus Mandana. He knows Zab Judah, like we all know Zab Judah coming up in New York City because Zab Judah is an Israelite. <clears throat> Zab Judah's father, Yoel Judah, was taught martial arts by one of my teachers, Crown Prince Zeri Shaddai. And it's Crown Prince Zeri Shaddai's children, Akiva Ben Yehuda, Banahu Ben Yehuda, and Kemuel Ben Yehuda, that introduced me to this way of life in the year 1994. And it is their father that trained Zab Judah's father, Yoel Judah. So this brother that you guys are watching, pouring water, again, these are exhibits of humility. The brother is a three-time New York City Golden Glove champion, laid out several people, could have went pro, but had an injury and some other issues. This is our brother Shemi, much love and much respect to our brother Shemi. Uh, so here's this. <clears throat> so now that we're at the point of textual criticism, Now that we're at the point of our textual criticism and we're examining at this aspect uh, the vernacular, the syntax, morphology, uh, phonology, when we're talking about the language, this is some of our specialties up here. We do this very, very well. So let's go into it really quick. When we talk about a priest, the Hebrew word is a kohen. The main function of a kohen outside of the Christian concept is not to offer a sacrifice. So we, knowing the Hebrew vernacular, we don't make the term priest synonymous with someone who brings a sacrifice. No, we do not. Because we understand that the word kohen, in its literal meaning, when we get into etymological meaning in the root and the base, a kohen is one who brings another one to God. A kohen. It comes from the Hebrew word kohen. That's the base. Kaf. Wav Nun, Kon, which is also the Hebrew word for? All right, I'm going to stop the live there because everything that needed to be said was said. Um, if you guys would like to, on your own time, go back and watch the video, by all means, if you can. But I definitely want to say that this is a moment that um, I'm proud of to be having right now with, with my brother Divine. It's a proud moment, Divine. You and I have come a long way. <clears throat> We've seen a lot of people, brother, come into the community and go. We've seen a lot of people get supported, you know, get touted as the, the new Israelite hype man that was going to be the one. We watched them fall. We watched Israelites in our community that everybody looked up to be accused of some very distasteful things. We've watched some of our greats fall all the way down and not get up. And we still here, brother. There must be a reason why we're still here. And I believe that reason is that we have a lot of work to do. And so Together. Um, a lot of work together. to do together, brother. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. A lot of work to do together, man. So um, I thank you, brother. I'm going to look in the camera and say to you, I love you. I really do because um, as my Bane could tell you, and Bane, if, if you're available, I would love for you to hit the live stream. But uh, Ralph Kimmelow, that I described as my spiritual son, 
Me and him often have spoken about the divine prospect behind the scenes. And I have said to him, you know, being it's not that I don't respect his learning. I, I, I think divine is an amazing scholar. Like I admire things that he brings to the table. I've even said to Rob Kimmel that there are things that Divine says that I learn from, that I, that I can, that I also can learn from. Um, I, I said to him that I believe that there was things that happened either behind the scenes between us that has me feeling a little salty at times because I sometimes I, I didn't feel. I'm just going to use the opportunity to be really blunt, even if I'm wrong about what I'm saying. I just want to be very blunt about how I felt. There were times that I felt as if I wasn't supported by Divine as openly as I support him. You know, I felt that I went out of my way to always big him up, and I didn't always feel that he did the same. But one of the things that I didn't consider is that um, I'm not privy to every conversation he had about me publicly or privately. So who's to say he didn't, that I just didn't catch it? And also, this is even more important, does he need to loud and, and loud me and big up my name and praise me in order for me to respect him. That's a problem. That's a problem if I expect that in order for me to respect him, he has to be putting out my name. You don't have to do that. And if I'm doing it, I should just do it because it's the way I feel, but I shouldn't do it because he has to do it too, because that's not genuine. So again, I say I apologize to you, brother. This is an amazing moment for our community. This is a powerful moment for us. And um, I'm a, I, I want you to, uh, to close us out. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, like I had mentioned in the chat, um, there was me. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? All yes. right. Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah. So it was a call coming in. Um, yeah, I was saying that, like I was saying in the chat, even with that sit down, uh, <laughs> I was never the same because iron sharpens iron for real. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I brought out some good points, but some things that Zion said did humble me in that conversation. I had to go back and rethink or research and i appreciated that you know what i'm saying um because it wasn't like i was going against somebody who had no stature in the community that had that didn't have a good name and that didn't have a good reputation for their scholarship you know what i'm saying like this is like creme de la creme when it comes to torah you know what i'm saying so to have that sit down with him and be able to have that back and forth i think that that was necessary for my growth you know what I'm saying? And I appreciate Zion for that. Like he says, you know, I do big Zion up all the time. You know what I'm saying? Um, I may not always do it in big lights, right? But I do it enough that you can see it's recorded online and people behind the scenes. I always talk about how he was necessary in my growth coming into this walk. You know what I'm saying? He's been in this walk longer than me. You know what I'm saying? Um, as an Israelite. And you got to respect people who paved the path. You know what I'm saying? Like he mentioned for his elders and the elders that I've met in this walk as well. So I was um, grateful to have that sit down. You know what I'm saying? It was impromptu. And uh, like he said, everything Zion said about, you know, all the background and everything behind that was true. You know what I'm saying? I was not 100% prepared for uh, that discussion. However, I knew that I stood on the amount of truth that I knew at the time to have a dialogue. You know what I'm saying? And um, I thank Zion for even entertaining me and a conversation being that he still had more time in the walk than I did uh, to even merit that sit down. Um, and uh, there are some things that I've done over time, you know, as well, that's been wrong. You know, maybe some things I've also said, you know, I've, I can probably remember a couple of things that I should not, you know what I'm saying, in regards to Zion. And, you know, you, learn, you live and you learn, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, 10 years ago, you got to realize, you know, me and Zion, we may look young, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, we had our 40s, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but at that time, it was like, what, early 30s, you know what I'm saying? So you got you to gotta understand what it takes before you can get to eldership, right? That typically hits when you hit 50, I mean 50, 40. Mm -hmm. So all of that 30s, you know, you're leaving off that high testosterone for your 20s, and you're maturing out and flattening out in your 30s to when you hit 40, then you look back in reflection and say, wow, you know what? Even though I can't change what happened, I'm gonna use that past as fertilizer so I can grow better going forward. You know what I'm saying? And I can't I, I, I can't say anything bad about Zion because anytime we me and him have a blow or he has an issue with somebody, the brother always comes back to reconcile. That's one thing. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may take a year, <laughs> but I would rather I would I would rather it happen when it's the right time than my time. And I think sometimes that's the issue 
we want everything to happen in our timing and not Yah's time. So Yah, that was his will for it to happen here. Me and me and Zion are just pawns in his hands, right? Like uh, Yeshua who says, he is the father, we are the clay, you know? And as long as you're humble, like Zion says, the father can mold you how he sees fit for his glory, not ours. You know what I'm saying? So thank you, my brother. And that's all I ever wanted since we had that falling out, you know, is for you to apologize. And you did it in a bigger way than I anticipated. And I, I really respect you for that, my brother. I, I'm so glad that we reconciled. And I think that this is the epitome of Torah. It's reconciliation, right? Yah reconciling back with his children, which is Israel, and us reconciling with each other. That's all Torah talks about. Reconciling restitution with your brother when you fall out with them. So he's living Torah. You know what I'm saying? How can you get mad at a brother like that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How could you hate a brother like that? You know what I'm saying? And you got to remember, you know, me and Zion, you know, being in this side of things, you know, having experienced the Israelite walk and then the conscious community and then all these repeated attacks against us and the scriptures and what we stand for. I mean, it's a lot going on. And sometimes it's very difficult to trust people, you know what I'm saying, in this type of environment. You know, especially when you have other people in our ears. So I know I had a lot of people that be in my ears about Zion. I know he has a lot of people in his ears about me, and that's the problem, right? So mm -hmm. I've since cut those people off, and I don't associate with anybody that says anything negative about my brother. I don't care if it's personal. I don't care if it's secular, whatever. It doesn't. I don't. I don't allow that to get into my spirit because I have no ants against the brother, even though when I've fallen out, family has fallen out. My, my real brother, me and him had fallen out before. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's to be expected. But at the end of the day, once reconciliation can be seen out front and we allow ourselves to be the pawns for Yah to use us to do so, this is a momentous thing, my brother. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for also giving us some history. Thank you for your humility, for teaching me. You know what I'm saying? That I need to be more humble to those that I may have arts against as well. This was a whole learning experience for me. Everything's coming back 360, my brother. So I appreciate you and everything that you've contributed to this walk. Likewise, Hallelujah. Man. Likewise, I want to answer somebody's question really quick before you go. Um, I, I would recommend the Masoretic text for study. Uh, I see I see value in the King James Bible. Maybe not the same value I obviously would see in the Masoretic, but I, I definitely uh, would promote that. Um, Divine taught me something that I'm going to also share publicly. Uh, divine is the reason why I also now own the Samaritan text. Uh, during my discussions with him, he continually referenced it. And I didn't see value in it until I bought the Samaritan text and said, there's extreme value here, right? Because they're, they're capturing things that was lost to, in the Masoretic uh, text. If the Masoretic text doesn't account for it, but it's highly necessary for us to be aware of, right? So you know, again, each of us are bringing things to the table that one may not have or one may not have in the same capacity, but as he said, iron is sharpening iron. Iron is sharpening iron, and together we are always powerful. Like if, if we notice the creator never sent one person, Moses, Aaron, right? It's never one person. It's always a lot. It's always more than one. And I believe the reason why the creator does that is because he gets the glory. If we, if we, Imagine if Moses was sent alone, people would worship him, right? Um, because of how impactful Yeshua is, Christians worship him, right? So there's a problem then in the way in which people focus on one man because they want to make that one man God. So I believe that the creator always sends several. Like remember at one time Elijah says, I alone am left of the prophets. And God said, no, homeboy, for I have hit 50 to a cave. And there's about three caves, so that's about 150. You ain't alone. So while we're walking around so full of ourselves, and that's what knowledge does, you know, it's, it's not entirely wrong. It's, it's human. Knowledge will have you flowing to a certain extent, but it's up to you to humble yourself and come back down to earth. And that's what makes a man. Knowledge naturally will have you floating, but it's up to you. Your integrity shows by your ability to consciously bring your behind right back down and realize that no matter how much the creator has blessed you with this wisdom, you are no different than your brother and your sister. Right, so um, I want to now say um, that um, I look forward to me and Divine possibly doing something. I think that um, a conference is needed. Me and Divine have been now 10 years into talking about touring together. I would love to do something called the Messiah Conference, where we go around the nation and possibly internationally and speak about the Messiah. 
I think me and his brother together, with humility, I'm going to say I, I feel like we're unstoppable. I could be wrong, but in my humility, I'm going to say I feel like we're unstoppable. I feel like whoever is on the opposing end, they got a whole problem. I feel like that. I agree. So I want to say much love to you, my brother, because I didn't get that say that I love you as well. It has been nothing but love since day one. And um, I mean, I'm with it. Let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Let's, let's talk behind the scenes, find out uh, what cities that we're going to hit up and um, just let me know because um, I'm down. And I think that this is something that has never been done in the community before. This is epic. You know what I'm saying? If, if we want to use that as a word. And this is paving the path for those in the future who come behind us to actually bring it further. You know what I'm saying? And that's the goal, right? The goal of the elders is to put those who are young on their shoulders so they can reach further. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that's what this is gonna do. So I don't think they're ready for it, but most high, yeah, you have, you, it's, it's in your heads. You know what I'm saying? So it's fact. gonna be I, a wrap, man. I wanna remind people that I've seen Divine in his moments as not just a scholar, but also as a warrior, right? Divine may not know that I'm, I'm privy to some of the things, but I, I, I see a lot. I see a lot. I, I remember when, when Garfield was trying to play himself, and from what I understood, from what came back to me, Devon pulled up and was like, well, what you want? Uh, I'm not supposed to be going into this, but y'all get the point. We're not just talking about people who are willing to just open the book and defend. If need be, we really defend this with all we got. On that last note, I wouldn't be me if I didn't say this. Divine, at some point, you really got to tell the people how much said he didn't want these hands. Oh, at some man. point, you got to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, I, don't think he, I don't think he expected Zion to, to do that. You know what I'm saying? And, that, and that's the problem. You know what I'm saying? They think because we in these scriptures that we soft. No, my end. I ain't going to say the word. But my ninja. We, we keep Torah. Torah says eye for an eye. That's that's, right. that's what we get down with. So if that's what we following and you're not privy of that, then you don't know what's coming behind that once you step to us and said he didn't want the smoke. And that was he just did. the end of that. You know what I'm saying? He, so he definitely know. didn't want the smoke. If I, if I, <laughs> I was saying, right? I just I, I had to go it. stop Zion. I didn't stop I didn't stop studying. I stopped, I stopped Zion. I'm like, yo, I thought yo, Zion, chill. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't worried about saying, like, yo, Zion, chill. You know what I'm saying? Like, and Rep Hill didn't know what to do. Like, okay, which one should I say? I'm like, yo, just tell, tell Zion to chill out. Like, Zion is the one, like, you're getting steady. You feel what I'm saying? So, yeah, that was, that was crazy right there. You know what I'm saying? I was like, yo, Zion, man, don't, like, like come on, man. I had to get in between to stop. If it wasn't for me, <laughs> Zion would have did something. But he, he he didn't want to swing and accidentally like hit me or something like that. So I was like, yo, Zion, I had to push this dude back. Like, yo, chill, Zion. Like, you know what I'm saying? Zeddy just woke and Zeddy's not really advancing. Zion was advancing. That's why I got I stood up and I got in between. I'm like, yo, Zion, chill. Chill like. Right. You know, sign a sign a little too old to kind of break up a fight and nothing like that. But I was like, yo, Zion. So you got to think about this, man. Like, there's other people here. Like, come on, man. You know, he, he's seeing red. They're like, yo, Zion, you got to chill, bro. You know what I'm saying? So so, so let them keep thinking that. And it's okay. You know, you when you when when that happens, you have the upper hand. You have the advantage, right? Because they're going to be off guard if we respond. We we prefer to respond amicably, right? Of course, but of course. We, we're going to defend not just the Torah. We're going to defend ourselves by any means necessary, right? And that's why... Us being together so dangerous because the outside world sees the rise of black messiahs and that becomes problematic. You know what I'm saying? And that's one thing we gotta we gotta realize why so many people are sent to put whispers in our ear, because Cointel understands by the algorithms that analyze the content that we talk about, the things that we put out, that yo, this black messiah is rising up. Whoa, we can't have that. You know what I'm saying? And then now we reconcile it, it's really a wrap. Right. So yeah. Much so love to you, my if, brother. If, if the yep, community exactly. don't realize that what we're really talking about, the picture we're trying to paint, imagine if Tupac and Biggie squashed their beef. Because for the Israelite community, that's what we're talking about. Imagine if Pac and Biggie squashed their beef. Because for the Israelite community, that's literally what we're talking about with me and his brother here. And um, he, he may have pressed the wrong button again, but... Um, I'm gonna throw the loop back in just in case. We may have pressed the wrong button again. Gotta throw the loop back in just in case. But we're gonna we're also bring this to a close. So um I wanted divine to do the honor in closing us out with a prayer. Um I'll give a couple of moments to see if he could do if, he could, if he's gonna return. 
because I want to give him the honor to close this out with a prayer. Um, and I want to leave the community with a lasting thought. I will come back uh, eventually and show the history that I wanted to show. Uh, there's a lot of history that I, I was prepared to show you guys, but naturally we had Divine join us, and I had to shift back to the topic. But there's a lot of history that I want to go into and just show you guys the lineage of the Israelite elders that came before us so that we could understand and be honored by those who gave service not just to the community but to the creator that allows for us to have a voice in the platform today. Like we, we become so high on how we're received by the public and we don't properly pay homage and, and proper due to those who come before us. That's why I began you know, speaking so highly about the temple and congregation that I come from, right? In spite of any differences that we have, um, I still love my brothers. I still love my teacher, Hana C. Sipor. I feel like um, Prince Nat Ben Zibaloon, um, the eldest son of Prince Sipor. I wish with my heart and my soul that was my older brother. Like, I love him. You know, I don't care what people say. There's a brother from my congregation uh, known as Prince Nat. And um, if I ever related to anything in the book, it was the love that David and Jonathan had. We ain't talking about no funny love. We're talking about real brothers. And that's how I saw Prince Nat. And that's how I see Prince Nat. I see him as my real brother. We've had some some differences over the years, and, and, and I'm going to say without saying much, not because of him, but for whatever reasons, we've had differences as a result. Um, Devon, I'm going to mute my mic to do something real quick, but um, please bring us into a closing prayer. But before you actually bring us to the prayer part, could you just say some closing words for the community? And then when you see me back on the screen, I want to give you the honor to close us out with prayer. All right, I'll buy you some time. Um, all right, family. So, um, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the good thing about a session or a live like this, besides the gems being dropped, the history being shared, reconciliation that you see and experiencing, is that we have to use our lives as a sacrifice for others. You know what I'm saying? And I think that a lot of people typically, they tend to defer that task to those who are battle proven, those who have paved the way, those who have taken the risk. And um, what we don't realize is that each and every one of us, we have, we've been endowed with the same capabilities. Uh, me and Zion is just examples, right? That we strive to be so that others don't follow us, but follow a greater example that have gone before us, right? The recognition of our elders, you know, um, not just on a large scale for those of you doing this work, but also within your household and your homes with your family, your children, your spouses, you know what I'm saying, et cetera. So all of us have the capabilities of performing what me and Zion has done and doing it at an even greater level. You got to realize if we call ourselves a nation, you can never have the same employment in a nation. There are different roles for different people to perform different tasks. And we're not to measure ourselves against others but with the calling that Yah has given each and every one of us. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate this time and this reconciliation has been a long time coming. Um, and I'm grateful to have this moment, a uh, historic moment, I'll say that. And I pray that Yah gets all the glory from this. You know, and with that, I'll close out in prayer with the permission of my elder, Sign, because technically I don't want to give his age out, but he is, he is an elder. <laughs> he, is, he is an elder. He, he got a couple of years on me, so. Uh, with your permission, Elder, I'll go ahead and, and I'll pray us out. Oh, we can't hear you, Zion. I think you muted. Is that me? Oh, absolutely. Please oh, there we go. Please. Oh, we can't hear you. It's an honor. Okay. All right. Dear Abiyah, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you and thank you for another day for us to reconcile with our fellow brothers and sisters, no matter what the art we may have with each other, Most High Yah. We want to get that right and reconcile so we may stay within the covenant fold that you have given us in your Torah. We want to continue to be Kodesh and be set apart for your use, Most High Yah. We are clays in your hand. Mold us and do what you see fit, Most High Yah. Turn us into vessels that you can fill up and that you can use to overflow so we may spill in the cups of others who are in need. We pray that our lives will be a living sacrifice used to honor you, Most High Yah. 
and that no matter what we go through, Most High Yah, that you get the honor, glory, and praise. We understand that the synergy of the situation is that the greater sum is more than all the parts put together. We must continue to embrace the good, bad, and ugly because that has placed us on the path that we are in today to put us in our calling to progress us forward. And we are honored for this opportunity in this day and time in 2023 to have this moment of clarity with you, Most High Yah. And we thank you for pouring out your Ruach into your vessel, Zion Lex, so that way he can show forth a greater example that all of us can take points from. We would thank him for the gems that you've shared through him, and we pray that you would continue to get the glory in this reconciliation, and that all have been blessed and cups have been filled from this dialogue discussion, and that you are raised up in glory, Most High Yah. We pray this prayer in your name, Yah, that we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, Almighty God, God of our forefathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, true and living God, even the Most High God. You are our creator, our maker, our owner, and our possessor, and to you belongs the life of all worlds. I pray in your name, O great King, that you continue to bless this union, that you allow us to grow in our brotherhood, in our friendship, and in our contribution towards the community and even our nation. I pray, O great King, that you cause our community to be inspired by what we're witnessing today, to use this as a template and example to know that when there are differences, differences can be worked out amicably and righteously, that we don't have to be at odds. To remain at odds is to remain not just separated from one another, but separated from you. I, was, I read somewhere in the Torah that when the tribes of Israel unite, the Creator is revealed. So we can never reveal the Creator properly and genuinely. We can never reveal your will and manifest you, O Creator, and bring about the coming of the Mashiach unless we begin to first genuinely unite one among another. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for allowing Divine Prospect, a brother that I have admired over the years, to inspire me in ways that he doesn't know. And I also thank you, O Great King, for allowing uh, humility to be the setting in this dialogue to where we can even come together and use this as a template. With that being said, I pray, O Great King, that this entire community is blessed, and I pray that we have more strong, able-bodied men and women that stand in your name. Time is not for us. Time is against us. We are not getting younger. I tell people all the time that we have to begin to all step up. We each and all play a role towards our redemption. No one man, no one woman is going to do it. It takes the entire nation. Moses prays at one time, and he says, would it all that God's people would be able to be prophets? So I say, may it all that God's people be able to stand strong and do thy will and show the world who we were created, formed, and made to be, even Yisrael. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 Thank you so much for All your right. time, Elder. I appreciate it. And again, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Let's build. Oh, let's no. put some things in the works. And I uh, thank the most high for you and uh, for your existence and helping me to step up my game as well. So all praise Likewise, to the most high. Man. Likewise. Thank you so much, Devon. Take care, all right? You too, King. Shalom. All right, shalom. All right, everyone. All right. That was good, man. That was good. That was literally history in the making. That was quite literally history in the making. Um, I want to kind of influence Divine to kick off um, our conference uh, somewhere outside of New York City because I feel as if the finale should be in New York City because that's where both he and I were, was born and raised. So I think it would be only right and fitting that we return home. Um, I've been in dialogue with some great elders for many, many years. Um, and, you know, with respect to elders that I've been speaking with, you know, very closely lately, I want to say um, much respect to our elder, uh, Saar, uh, from the kingdom of Yah, K-O-Y, Saar Amadiel, who lives in Israel and has been part of the, the kingdom of Yah for many, many years. Um, he has extended an invite for me to come to Israel to speak. And um, I want to also extend that invite to Brother Divine. 
I don't think that we should just be speaking in America domestically. I think that we should take this message of this word internationally. So hopefully uh, when this trip happens to Israel, I could have my brother Divine Prospect also be there. And I ask that if the community sees any value in this, that they will support this on any level possible. So with that being said, make sure you guys join Kingdom Harbinger Ministry. If that is the information that you gravitate to and you like the way in which it flows, then join it. I also invite you guys to join Learn Toward Hebrew Academy if you like the information that flows there and you enjoy it. And above all, support all facets of Israelite growth and empowerment so long as it is aligned with the will of the Creator in a way that is tangible that we can all see and touch. With that being said, I think we, we did a very honorable duty today. And um, there's nothing left for me to say except to say Shalom Alechem. Much love to everyone. Thank you guys for being here. Do not forget to support the platform. I think that uh, what we did today was definitely worthy of a donation. So we have 142 people in the building. We had even more than that earlier. I would ask that everybody send a donation. You can send a donation uh, via Cash App. The Cash App is uh, Cash App symbol, dollar sign, Zion Rex. Uh, the PayPal is ZionRex at gmail.com. If you would like to join the classes, that's patreon.com forward slash learn tour. That's patreon.com forward slash learn tour. The way that you can donate to this platform is to hit up the Cash App. Again, that's dollar sign, Zion Rex, as well as PayPal, ZionRex at gmail.com. Um, we had an amazing live today, and I could only look forward for what's going to come because I'm sure that what's going to come is going to be something beyond our expectations. Um, I have a feeling, I have a hunch that what we will come together and do and create will be greater. Uh, okay, shout out to my brother Hashar. General Hashar sent the donation. I see you, General Hashar. Shout out to you, General. I was speaking about you earlier. Make sure you play back the live. I definitely mentioned you earlier. And um, Hashar, if you can, you got my number. Uh, I would like to interview you on my platform, man. I would love to have you on the show. So when you're next free, Hashar, uh, please let me know. I would love to have you on this platform. I would love to have you on this platform. And to everybody else, to our moderators, you guys always do a marvelous job. I appreciate you all. And uh, to everybody who's watching, salute to you all. And with that, I'm going to say shalom. And we're going to have a word from our sponsors. I also want to say thank you to uh, Christine Alvarez, uh, who's also part of Learn to Hebrew Academy. I see it. you just sent us a donation. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. And to everyone else, peace. Much love to you all as we close out with one more of our sponsors. I wash my natural hair and my face with the same product because natural hair care is easy. Natural skin care is easy. Don't make it hard. If you want to have a better view on how the Bible looks at women in its proper context, then you should get these two books. Matrix of the Covenant, Written by Abdil Ben Levi, popularly known as Zion Lex. This is a masterpiece. All right, all right. And lastly, I, I wouldn't be me if I didn't say this. To Rabbi Kweti Aman, I would love to have an um, open dialogue with you whenever you're free. 
either on your platform or my platform at any time of your choosing. I've seen that you've made some videos as of late where you're responding to things that I've said that you disagree with, and that's all fine. But whenever you're ready, and I am certainly ready, just reach out. And we can um, talk about some of those things that we differ on, and we can begin to talk about those things that we agree on, and maybe we can have a more meaningful dialogue and conversation. So the ball is in your court. Hopefully we can have that conversation. With that being said, shalom and peace to everybody. And I'm out.